This presentation is a historical account and analysis of Discover Graphics, a defunct museum school community partnership through the Smithsonian Institution that for 24 years provided professional level printmaking, studio and museum experiences to high school students, college students, and art teachers in the Washington DC metropolitan region. As a former participant in the program, I wondered what made Discover Graphics unique, critical, and transformative. How did it benefit both the museum and the DC community? And in what ways did it influence the lives of those young people who participated? I read publications about the program, interviewed artists affiliated with it, the museum educator in charge of the program, reviewed 13 boxes of documents from the Smithsonian archives covering the period of 1971 to 1981, and examined my own memories as a student in the program and its impact on my career. So this is a historical research um, method that I used so interviews and document review and analysis and my own autoethnographic narrative. I employed a critical race theory CRT lens to reflect on my experience as a student in Discover Graphics, its transformative effect on my education and career and determine its relevance to BIPOC youth and artists in Washington, DC at the time, which is where it took place in my hometown. Viewing art history, education, and art making through a critical race, race theory lens exposes the centrality of race and racism in the arts and reveals how the dynamics of race and racial oppression manifest both explicitly and implicitly through assumptions, practices, and frameworks that define the art and art education field. CRT is a useful method to highlight the intersectional ways race, class, and gender can inform historical research. The development of CRT in the 1970s coincided with the Black power and Black arts movements gaining traction at the same time I was a participant in the program. The unspoken intent of Discover Graphics program was to provide Black students in particular with opportunities to visit the museum, learn an art medium, printmaking in this case, that they would not normally have access to in their public school classrooms. And in 1969, the Washington Print Club, in an effort to interest more art teachers and students in printmaking mediums organized the first high school graphics exhibition at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, specifically for Washington DC public high school students, which was at the time predominantly black. Um, the first place winner was Eastern high school student Thomasine Michener pictured here uh, with her teacher, Teresa Grana also pictured here. Um, and her success encouraged other art students to experiment with printmaking. So why printmaking specifically? Because it wasn't something that public schools had access to. The equipment, the presses, um, the etching tools, pretty much what was going on in terms of printmaking in high schools at the time was basically relief processes using linoleum. So um, Jane Farmer, who was a staff associate for secondary education at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which at the time was called the National Collection uh, of American Art, um, conceived of Discover Graphics in 1971 after the success of a well-attended printmaking day that she organized at the museum with co-sponsorship from the Washington Print Club so Farmer felt that the museum needed to expand its educational offerings for secondary students beyond the typical docent tour. So what you see here 
is a picture that I got from the Smithsonian Archives of Printmaking Day. And you can see how many people were there. And the majority of them are Black students. So Farmer planned the Printmaking Day at the museum to bring together the Washington DC area secondary school students, their art teachers, professional printmakers who did demonstrations and printmaking suppliers to participate in demonstrations of the four traditional printmaking processes. That is intaglio, relief, planography, which is like um, uh, lithography and serigraphy or silkscreen printing. Over 600 students and teachers attended that printmaking day. So after the success of Printmaking Day, Jane Farmer contacted the Charles Brand Printing Press Company, which was headquartered in New York City, about donating printing presses, which they very generously provided, eventually gifting seven intaglio and lithography presses to the museum. The museum's location was truly strategic as it was adjacent to the newly built Martin Luther King Jr. Main Public Library, um, which you see in circled in red there, which is number um, two. Um, and that was built in 1972. Um, in fact, it is the only Mies van der Rohe building in Washington, DC. And I believe it was the last building he designed um, and that library included exhibition spaces for local artists. There was also the newly opened Federal City College, um, DC's first public college, um, which opened in 1968 and was located right across, where the small red circle is, right across from um, the MLK Library, which is number two there. Um, and at the time that FCC, Federal City College, opened, the Black arts movement was underway, and the mostly Black and Brown student applicants enrolled in art and music courses. So art and music was a huge draw for students who uh, were interested in attending FCC. Unfortunately, FCC's art resources were limited, so having access to the museum uh, which was located where number seven is, that big red circle where there's also a metro, makes it easily accessible, um, helped FCC provide the limited resources they needed uh, for students to, to take on arts and um, music programming. So the printmaking program that Discover Graphics um, provided at the museum was a huge boon to the visual arts and art history students at FCC. So this map is a circa like 1970s map of DC. The red circle at the very top is um, the Carnegie Library, um, which was the one of the first, it was, it was the main library until MLK Library was built. So, um, this became a museum, a print, the museum opened a printmaking studio in what had been uh, gallery spaces. So with the presses on the way, they converted this room near the print collection um, into a professional printmaking studio. Um, using a chairman's grant from the National Endowment for the Arts um, allowed the museum to purchase all the supplies and hire local artists to teach in Taglio and lithography in the museum studio. And the studio included visuals, which you can see in the background, um, demonstrating the four basic printmaking processes and supplemental equipment. In preparation for the pilot program, which took place from 1971 to 1972, following the printmaking day, um, the museum hired a local printmaker, John Sirica, to spend 12 intensive weeks in his own printmaking studio, training 11 art majors from Federal City College in intaglio processes. 
The college students assisted Sirica with teaching 10 art teachers from the public schools in DC and 10 high school students for a total of 110 participants. They met for four weekday mornings over four weeks at the museum printmaking studio. And the end result was an exhibition of the high school and college students prints at the museum. The exhibition provided public exposure for the program and allowed the students to engage with one another's works. Utilizing the resources of the museum, high school students and their teachers were provided with in-depth studio art museum experiences alongside studio-based teaching and learning. Participants engaged with museum staff in printmaking, history and critique, using the print collection as a resource. Participants in Discover Graphics were introduced to printmaking mediums in depth to better understand the role and experience of a practicing artist. So here you see, starting with the early years, 1972 to 75, uh, several public school art teachers um, being trained by uh, Alan Kaneshiro, who the museum hired, he was an educator and a printmaker to teach the processes in the studio space. In 1972, Jane Farmer retired and she suggested that art teacher Teresa Grana, who you may remember who taught at Eastern, whose student won the first um, uh, Washington Print Club show exhibition prize. Um, she she asked for Teresa to replace her. She suggested that. And so Teresa did. And as an experienced artist and educator with deep connections in Washington, D.C., Brana was an excellent choice to replace Farmer. In her role as associate curator of education, she managed and expanded Discover Graphics between 1972 and 1981, which is when she worked for the program. Um, so here you see Teresa, oddly enough, these are pictures that I got from the Smithsonian records, and that is one of my art teachers. So this is actually students from my high school, H.D. Woodson, with Patricia Giles, who's standing there pointing, um, and Teresa Grana is next to her with the, with the blazer on. Um, so this happens to be a group of students from H.D. Woodson who are looking at prints from the museum's print collection. So Discover Graphics <coughs> took place in six four-week cycles each school year. All DC area secondary schools were eligible to apply for the program. And at this point that included um, private schools as well. And between 12 and 15 students uh, per chosen school participated in the museum workshop. Students spent one full school day each week of the cycle in the museum studio. And then the second component of the program provided a traveling brand intaglio press um, delivered to the school, four schools per cycle um, for one month, a one month loan during that program cycle. So along with the press, schools also received printing supplies and paper, valued at $2,000 and access to a trained college intern to assist the art teachers in teaching printmaking. So what you see here is Georgia Deal as a young um, artist recently graduated from her MFA program at the University of Georgia. And she had been hired to work with Alan Kaneshiro. I think it was in 1980. And she was working with the um, traveling press program. So here you see her with several Smithsonian um, employees gathering everything to be delivered to a school for the traveling program. So my experience took place as a high school student between 1975 and 1977. And you see me there on the right working on a stone lith lithograph. And then with a group of <clears throat> fellow students from H.D. Woodson speaking with a um, docent and reviewing the print collection there at the museum. So my first experience was in 10th grade with the traveling press program. So the press had come to Woodson and I learned the etching process 
during that cycle. And I created a self-portrait. The, the photograph you see of me here, I'm a senior in 12th grade, and I took part in the museum-based program that year. And as a result, I fell in love with printmaking um, because of this experience. And so my time in the program provided me with an opportunity to help produce a catalog and interview Harlem Renaissance DC-based printmaker James Wells, who um, basically started the printmaking program at Howard University. Um, and I also um, to participated in the exhibition that year. My prints were in the exhibition, and that led to a lifelong love affair with printmaking. Uh, I, I went on myself to earn my MFA in printmaking from Howard University. And to this day, I'm a practicing artist, primarily in relief printmaking and bookmaking. Here you see um, a group of students that were um, basically we had like a, a council of students who were responsible for the exhibition planning and the catalog. And there I am second from the left. <laughs> so this is a long time ago, 1977. So since the overarching goal of Discover Graphics was to help students and their teachers use the resources of the museum to understand and more fully be be more fully engaged in the creative process and the role of art and artists in their lives, three specific goals were developed for students in the program. One, to strengthen their understanding of the historical significance of printmaking. Two, to encourage them to look at prints when they visited the museum, so to come to the museum and to see prints. And three, to help them learn how to look at and appreciate prints by making them themselves with a very worthy and educationally transformative program, um, the complexity involved in it, like from the traveling piece of it, the cost of the supplies, because um, all of this was free. Teachers, no one paid anything for this program. Um, it was really difficult to secure external funding, external grants for the program. Um, and so even though it was very transformative, for everyone involved, um, you know, the museum kind of felt like, well, we're paying all this out. We're trying to get grants for this. Um, maybe the school should take on some of the costs. And, and that really wasn't realistic for um, public schools for the most part that didn't even have the supplies they needed to teach this at the school. So Grana decided that the best course would be to include the program within the museum's operat operating budget. And she was able to accomplish that with the support of the director of the museum, Dr. Joshua Taylor. So that is what made it actually able to, to sustain itself for 10 years, at least, um, between 1971 and 1981. Um, so unfortunately, um, Dr. Taylor died suddenly in 1981. And his eventual replacement, Charles Eldridge, shifted the focus of the museum from community outreach to centering research and the collection. Uh, he dismantled the elementary and secondary education programs, which included Discover Graphics and the small solo exhibitions that featured local artists and collectives. And these initiatives severely impacted DC's black and brown arts community and they were underserved and ignored to begin with. So shutting down that small gallery where they were able to show their work, as well as closing down this program that developed future black and brown artists had a, had a big impact. Um, so according to Eldridge, abolishing the educational programs would save the museum $100,000 per year and enable them to achieve its mandate as a national resource. So this has always been, I think, a bone of contention for Washingtonians. We are not a state. We don't have the same benefits as a state. Um, yet we are a federal city. We've got all these wonderful museums that are free, but there's not much there in terms of the local economy. There are, most of the museums are national museums. Um, so trying to um, cultivate arts and culture for the local community has always been kind of a, 
a difficult thing. So Eldridge did acknowledge the success of Discover Graphics and its positive impact on both the museum and local students. However, he felt that the program was inappropriate for a National Art Museum to support. And so the program closed out in 1983. However, it was revived under the Smithsonian Associates Program, which is um, in the castle there on the mall. And it, it managed to survive um, under the leadership of Skip Barnhart, so you, who you see down here at the in the middle bottom through 1995. And at that point it was funded through grants and it was just got more and more difficult to, to get grants to fund the program. So because I did this research in 2020, just as the pandemic was setting, starting to shut things down. I did this research at the Smithsonian during my spring break um, in March of 2020. I was only able to get the records from the Smithsonian for the first 10 years of the program. So I had to kind of reconstruct what happened between 1979 and 1995. And I happen to remember that my former colleague, Georgia Deal, we were colleagues at the Corcoran, uh, Corcoran College of Art and Design. I happen to remember her saying that she worked with the program briefly. So I got on a Zoom call with Georgia and she then connected me with Skip and I had um, a great conversation with them. And Skip actually had some photographs of the time when Georgia was teaching in the program. And he brought me up to speed on this, this last, last half about um, what happened with the program. So I actually, I found a lot of evidence for the program's impact in the archives, reflections from my personal story and interviews with these folks here who managed and taught in the program Few museum programs offer the breadth and depth that Discover Graphics did, encompassing art and museum educators, curators, college and high school students, professional artists, gallerists, critics, and commercial art providers through an intense exploration of one artistic medium sustained over a long period of time. After del delving deeper into the history of the program, I'm still curious about a few things. How many students total participated over the course of the, that time period? And are there other museums in the United States that have similar programs with printmaking or other mediums free of cost? Researching these questions might uncover further evidence of the critical role museum programs like Discover Graphics play in quality art education for young people and particularly BIPOC students and those in under-resourced school systems. Joanne Lewis summed up the impact of the program succinctly in a Washington Post article. Discover Graphics is a learning experience, one which will forever make art lovers, if not artists, out of the participants. And it isn't that, after all, what museum education should be about. Um, I published this article in a book um, written by or edited by uh, Carissa Descendio and Laura Bobic. And if you're interested in reading the whole article, it's, it's a, the whole chapter, it's pretty long. Um, uh, I've included a QR code for it. Um, I think on the last page here, there, there's a QR code for the article if you're interested in reading further. Um, thank you. And I don't know, I'm, I'd love to see something like this happen in the future, maybe a, a partnership between a college and a museum. But it was a totally transformative program for me. And it's one reason why I'm a printmaker today. <laughs>